Let's stand together again. We'll sing the hymn that's on the back of your bulletin. <clears throat> so clear and Christ honoring and simple and love the tune. <clears throat> We're going to have to sing that more often. <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles together to Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4. I've titled this message Christ and the Law. Those of you that have been with us through the preaching of this wonderful book know that Boaz, our kinsman redeemer, Ruth's and Naomi's kinsman redeemer, is a picture of Christ. And that we are seen in this Moabitist woman uh, whose name was Ruth whose name translated means friendship. And uh, scripture speaks of Abraham being a friend of God. And uh, what hope we have that the Lord Jesus Christ as our kinsman redeemer would restore us who are by nature at enmity with God and make us friends of God. Make us friends of God. In order for that to happen, he had to satisfy the demands of the law. The law was a kinsman nearer to us than Christ. That law stood in judgment against us. And in order for the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem us, he had to, he had to deal with the law. He had to satisfy the demands of the law on our behalf. And that's what our text this morning is about. I stand before you keenly aware of the fact that there are but two kinds of people in the world. There are but two kinds of people here this morning. Whether we are here this morning as 
believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have been brought by God's grace to the knowledge of Christ. Or whether we remain lost and spiritually dead, separated from God by our sin, regardless of which group we might fit in, there is a message that both groups need to hear. There is one message that both groups need to hear. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. If the Lord has already called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and revealed Christ in you, if by his free and sovereign grace he has saved you, there is an enemy to your soul that is always trying to rob you of your hope and of your joy and always trying to put you under the law. You have a self-righteous Pharisee in you. And your flesh, just like those children of Israel who were in the wilderness, who said, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt where there was leeks and garlics and onions. We're tired of this light bread. There's a part of you that would go back to Egypt and would look for some comfort and for some hope of your salvation in your law keeping. If you've never tasted of the heavenly gift and you've never known freedom from the law, if you are still looking for something that you have done or are doing in order to win favor with God in order to work your way to heaven. I have good news for you. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He has delivered us from the curse of the law. And so you see Believers and unbelievers alike need to hear what Christ has done. Because we all face the same problem. Ruth chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 6. Boaz has gathered at the city gate ten elders. He is conducting an open court. He is reckoning with this kinsman who is nearer to Ruth than he is. And it's a picture, as we saw last Sunday, of how the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross and in an open court before all men to see. No no historical event is more credible, is more testified to, as more witnesses than the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was himself reckoning with the law on behalf of his people. And so that's what this is a picture of. And now the kinsman said, Boaz has said to this kinsman, Naomi has returned. Her husband Elimelech sold the family plot and uh, she has nothing. And according to the law, it is the responsibility of the near kinsman to purchase this land back so that The name of Elimelech and of his descendants will not not be gone out of the annals of of Israel. And uh, he says to this near kinsman, redeem it. And oh, by the way, and the kinsman said, I will redeem it. And, 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 
And, and, and Boaz says to him, well, by the way, in the day in which you redeem Naomi's land, you also have to redeem her daughter-in-law. For Naomi, of Ruth, her daughter-in-law, was married to Naomi's son, who is now dead. And so, so Ruth is part of the family now. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, she's a Moabite. And here's the response of this near kinsman in verse 6. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right thyself, for I cannot redeem. And notice the little word it is in italics. What God is saying to you and me is that the law cannot redeem us. I cannot redeem. In order for me to redeem you, I would have to lower the standard of God's holy law to the level of your obedience. Otherwise, I would sacrifice God's holiness and God's justice in order for me to be able to redeem. The law is not saying I can't redeem you. The law is saying I can't redeem. It's not in my power to redeem. I cannot purchase back that which has been lost. You lost your possession in the fall of your father Adam. And believers and unbelievers alike are tempted some are still completely under the law, those who have not come to Christ. But the believer who is not under the law has to be reminded. <laughs> you're not under the law, you're under grace. <laughs> Why? Because there's a part of us. There's a part of us that looks to our law keeping as the means of our redemption. And the law is saying, it's not in my power to redeem. It's impossible for me to redeem. I'll mar my inheritance. <laughs> this word mar means to destroy or to corrupt. So the holy standard of God's law would have to be destroyed or corrupted in order for the law to be able to redeem us. I can't redeem. I cannot lower the standard of God's holiness to the level of your obedience. I can't do it. It would destroy the very nature of God. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is holy. The law is just and the law is good. But here's what God's saying to me and you. The law can't make you holy and the law can't justify you and the law can't make you good. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Brethren and my friend who may yet be a stranger to God's grace, the law cannot Redeem. Cannot redeem. Child of God, all those voices and temptations of the accuser that wants you to go back to the law, the law can't redeem. Paul concludes first chapter 7 by saying, O wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? When I would do good, evil is ever present with me. I can't escape this body of death that I'm carrying about, this sinful nature that I have within me, this, this, this unbelief that would take me back to the law. Thanks be to God 
through Christ Jesus. I thank God through Christ Jesus. Verse 25, so then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. My flesh is just sinful. Nothing right about it. Chapter 8, verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. What does that mean? Well, he goes on to tell us in this same passage, they that do mind, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. In other words, what are you looking to? What are you minding for the hope of your salvation? Are you looking to your law keeping? Are you looking to fleshly means and fleshly methods? Are you looking to a decision you made, a work that you performed, a, a life that you're living, a, a, an experience that you, or are you minding the things of the spirit? And the spirit of God is like the wind and he listeth with us whoever he wills. He told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you've got to be born of the spirit of God. That's what the Lord's saying here. He's not saying you, oh, you're walking, you're walking this spiritual life so that your feet never really touch the ground and you're, and you're living above sin. And, and so therefore, there's now no condemnation for you because you're walking after the Spirit. That's not what the Lord's saying. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. They're looking to fleshly means and methods for their salvation. They're looking to the law. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They that are looking to fleshly things. Oh, just pray this prayer. Oh, just live this life. Oh, just show this evidence. And you take comfort and hope and peace in looking to those fleshly things. That's after the flesh. Child of God, you have an enemy. He's called Satan, and he's identified as the accuser of the brethren. Let me ask you a question, believer. What does the accuser do to accuse you? Does he not point out your sin and suggest that if you were really a child of God, you wouldn't think that way, you wouldn't act that way, you wouldn't talk that way, you wouldn't do those things. Like Job's miserable comforters, he points out your transgressions to the law. Now here's the problem with the accuser of the brethren. He doesn't go far enough. He doesn't go far enough. Our transgressions of the law are much worse than he leads us to believe. The accuser of the brethren leaves us thinking that we can satisfy the demands of the law if we would just do better. The lie is not that we've transgressed the law. The depth of our transgression is much worse than he suggests. The lie is that you can fix it. 
That's the lie. <laughs> you can fix it. You see, the accuser of the brethren always takes us back to the law and says, you know, if you'll just quit this and start that, you can, you can make this right with God. And you can... When the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, it's not like that. He leads us to its cause. And he leaves us with no option other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the accuser of the brethren leaves you with the option of obedience for fixing the problem. But when the Spirit of God convicts us of our sin, what, is it, what does the Lord say? When the Comforter comes, he will convict you of sin because of your unbelief. Now there's the root cause. The law doesn't say that. The law and the accuser of the brethren says the problem with your sin is that you've just done this or that or failed to do the other. And you can change that. You can clean up the outside of the cup. <laughs> and the inside will be still be full of corruption. You can whitewash the tomb and the inside still full of dead man's bones. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, he takes us to the heart of the problem. He says the reason for your sin is your unbelief. And he leaves you with no place to go other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are you going to go for faith other than him? What are you going to say? Lord, increase our faith. Where are you going to find faithfulness before God other than his law keeping and his obedience? There's the difference between the accuser of the brethren taking you back to the law and the spirit of God who takes you to Christ. Are we suggesting that Transgressing the law is okay, but you know that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when the Spirit of God convicts us of our sin, He leads us to Christ. And Christ leads to grace. The law is saying to you and me, cannot redeem. But Satan is also called the father of lies. When he takes you back to the law to try to fix the problem, he's lying to you. He's lying to you. The Spirit of God takes you to Christ. <laughs> and where the Spirit of God is, there's liberty. You see, you go back to the law, you just, you work harder, you try harder, you do more. You think, well, you know, if I can just, if I can just do that and you, and, and the, the, oh, all you that labor and a heavy burden come unto me, I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Learn of me. <laughs> Learn of me. Why is his burden easy? Because he has bore the full weight of the, of the law. He's born it. The full weight of God's law. He carried it when he bore our sins and suffered the full wrath of God's justice, which was what the law demanded and what the law requires. Turn to me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. First and second Timothy, Titus. Verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
And this is a faith. You say, well, what about, what about good works, preacher? Where do they fit in? Well, look at verse 8. This is a faithful saying. These things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. And don't miss the last phrase. These things are good and uh, they are profitable to men. It will be good and profitable to you and to those around you for you to do right. And there will be consequences to you and to those around you for you to do wrong. But doing right or doing wrong has no effect on your salvation. <laughs> you can't do anything to earn it. And you can't do anything to lose it. Now I know. There's some thinking, you know, preacher, you can't say that. It'll lead to men to a licentious living. It'll, it'll result in all sorts of sinful behavior. Let me tell you what the greatest offense to God is. Self-righteousness. That is the greatest offense to God. Robbing Christ of his glory in salvation and taking it to yourself by promoting your righteousness before men, before God. <laughs> oh, it's more evil than the, all the shameful things that men do. No, grace doesn't lead to shameful living. Grace leads to Christ. Leads to Christ. But here's the point. The law, that kinsman that's nearer to you and to me than Christ, says, I can't redeem. Don't look to me to redeem you. It's not in my power to do it. You can't satisfy my demands. You can't measure up in any way to the requirements of God. My second point, my first point is the law can't redeem. The second point is the law has yielded its claim to Christ. The law has yielded its claim to Christ. Now, in order for us to have some understanding of this next verse, we need to do two things. We need to consider for a moment the importance of genealogy and legacy in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a physical picture. Old Testament Israel is a physical picture of the spiritual realities completed in Christ. And so we know that there's a lot of emphasis in the Old Testament on genealogy and legacy and carrying on the family name. What is the significance of this? Well, it's comparable to our understanding of the Lamb's Book of Life. Your ancestry and your continuation of your name in the registry of the children of Israel is paramount to salvation. Outside of Israel, there's no salvation. People are talking about legacy. Men worry about their legacy in this world, don't they? You know, what kind of, what kind of name am I going to leave behind? And so they write books and put their name on them, and they build buildings and roads and cities, and they put their name on them, and they uh, 
build buildings and you know what yeah well, all these things they worried about their legacy child of god i promise you when you open your eyes in glory you're not going to have a single thought for the rest of eternity of what anybody here on the face of this earth thinks or has says about you. You won't care. If your name gets never breathed among men again, it won't matter, will it? What do you care? <laughs> You with the Lord. You have no thought of this life. You have no thought of this corrupt world. You're experiencing the fullness of your salvation. Oh, the, the vanity and the, the foolishness of men and their thoughts of worldly legacies. The Old Testament point of this is that only those who are found in the lineage and genealogy, spiritually speaking, of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. So all these Old Testament pictures point to that. They point to that. Now, with that being said, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. God gave in his law a means by which a woman whose husband died, a childless widow, might continue the legacy, the genealogy of her husband's name, lest it be erased from the history of Israel. It's a picture of salvation. And so that's what's happening in Ruth chapter 4. But here's the law. Here's the law in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Uh, we'll begin reading at verse 5. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her, that it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. You see that? What's happening? This is the, this is the, the Lamb's book of life. <laughs> this is where we want our name to be. We have to have our name there. And if the man, verse 7, like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto my brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so, so shall it be done unto thee, that man, done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. Now go back with me to our text. By the time that the book of Ruth is happening, this law had become a custom, not just relating to what we just read, but relating to all transactions of business. One man would take off his shoe and give it to the other as a sign of his submission to that man. 
Verse 7. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning exchanging. All business transactions were done publicly at the city gate and this tradition was followed as a sign of what was happening. A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee. And he, the kinsman, drew off his shoe and gave it to Boaz. Now, exposing one's feet in the Bible is to show submission to another's authority. So here this near kinsman is saying to Boaz, I submit to you and I relinquish my right as a near kinsman to you. You see that? Where do we see this in the Bible? Well, what about when Moses was at the burning bush in the wilderness and the Lord speaks to Moses and says to him, take off thy shoes from off thy feet for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. So Moses was now exposing his feet of clay, his creatureness to God. <laughs> and God was requiring it. Moses, you... And the same thing happened to Joshua after Moses died and Joshua was in the promised land and the Lord appears to Joshua. The Lord says to Joshua, Joshua, remember he saw the, 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 the angel with the flaming sword, Joshua, take off thy shoes from off thy feet for the ground in which you stand is holy ground. What about when John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming? And he said, I baptize you with water. But there is one who cometh after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to unlatch. I could never expose his feet. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You see the, you see the type here. The feet of the Lord Jesus Christ are not, we're, our feet are being exposed. The law's inability to redeem is being exposed. And, uh, and the law is yielding its claim to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for those of us who have feet of clay, brethren, here's the good news. The Bible speaks of our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel. <laughs> we have our creatureness, our sinfulness. You remember the seraphim that hovered over the throne of God in Isaiah chapter 6? And they had six wings. And with two they covered their eyes. They could not look upon the Lord Jesus. And with two they covered their feet. They were covering their nakedness. And with two they did fly. And they cried, holy, holy, holy. So you see the covering of the feet is the result of the gospel. When the Lord, when the, when the law takes off its shoe and gives it to Christ, it's yielding its claim to the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember when the prodigal came home and, uh, and the father lavishes him with kisses and he says, kill the fatted calf. My son, which was lost is now, is now found. And, uh, bring the robe the robe of righteousness, and put a ring upon his finger and put shoes upon his feet. Put shoes upon his feet. The Lord said through Joshua, reminding them of what God had done for them when he spoke to the children of Israel right after Moses died and right after they're back in the in, they're entering into the promised land. Here's what, here's what uh, Joshua said. For 40 years, thy shoes have not waxen old. The Israelites that entered into the promised land, 
wore the same pair of shoes that they left Egypt with. <laughs> Their shoes had not waxen old. God preserved them through all that time in the wilderness. I mean, how long does a pair of shoes last? And they were, they were on their feet all day long. <laughs> you know? Oh, it was a miracle. And that's the miracle of grace, that God has covered our feet. Listen to this, Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 1. Here's, God, here's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his church. And he says, How beautiful are thy feet with shoes. Oh, prince's daughter. He's speaking to his bride. He says, how beautiful are thy feet when they have shoes on them. <laughs> so there's the picture. There's the picture. Exposing one's feet was showing submission to another. And, and, and in doing this transaction, it was the law yielding its claim to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the next question. What is the claim of the law? What is the claim of the law? The wages of sin is death. The claim of the law is death. And what the Lord, what the scripture is telling us is that the law's claim on the grave and on death and on hell has been yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ who conquered death, grave, and hell. You see, here's the extreme example of how, of how no amount of law keeping will satisfy the demands of the law. Hell is eternal. Because it can never satisfy God's holy justice. That's why it's eternal. No end to it. Ever. Because God's never satisfied. The plucking off of the shoe on their near kinsman and giving it to Boaz is God saying to me and you, feet of the law have been exposed. The Lord Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. He has satisfied all its demands. And in his death, in his death, he has conquered its claim on you. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ was the only death. Hell will not satisfy the law. And the death of no man and no man suffer. You know, sometimes people get this idea that, well, salvation's by suffering. You hear people say, say that. You know, people suffer for long periods of time and, and our hearts go out to, you know, but, and they say, you know, he's in a better place now and he suffered so much that surely now the Lord's rewarded him for his suffering. No, no. The suffering of hell for eternity will not be rewarded with salvation. Only the death of the Lord Jesus Christ can satisfy the claims of the grave. <laughs> He's the only one that can open the grave. He's the only one that has the power to say, Lazarus, come forth. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? <laughs> Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here's what the Lord's saying. I yield my claim. I submit my authority to the only one who was able to conquer the grave. I take off my shoe and I submit to Christ. 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 15 look at me at verse 55 O oh, death where is thy sting O oh, grave and that word grave is the word hell where is thy victory 
The sting of death is sin. You see, the wages of sin is death. And the strength of sin is the law. <laughs> you see, the law only makes us, we try to, try to earn favor with God by our law keeping and all that law is going to do is make us more guilty before God. It's all it's going to do. It's going to make us more guilty. The strength of sin is the law. You want to you want to raise a rebellious child, just put them under the law. <laughs> they'll, either, they'll either grow up to be a Pharisee just like you, or they'll grow up to be the biggest lawbreaker you've ever seen. You know, but you, no. The strength of sin is the law. Either way, they're going to be lawbreakers. Uh, but, verse 57, thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's being pictured here in our story. The law has plucked off its shoe in light of what God had given in the law in Deuteronomy 25. And he's saying to Boaz, I can't redeem. And I submit to your authority. And you redeem it. What is the witness to this testimony? It is the resurrection. A wicked, God, the Lord Jesus said, a wicked and perverse generation is always looking for a sign, always looking for something. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They're always looking for some evidence. But the only sign that will be given unto it is the sign of Jonah, who spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. <laughs> now we know what that's a picture of. The only sign that God has given us that the law has yielded its authority over you and over death and over hell and over the grave is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead in order to say the law has been satisfied. The law has been satisfied. It holds no claim. There is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That's the picture. I give up my claim on death. I yield my power over the grave. And my final question very quickly, and we're going to read a passage of scripture to support this point. What exactly did Christ redeem? What exactly did he redeem? You back with me to our text in Ruth chapter 4. And Boaz, verse 9, said unto the elders and to all the people, you are witnesses this day. I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. And you are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. And the Lord make the woman to prosper. And she did. And Ruth, Naomi, have a child. I met Ruth and Boaz have a child. And his name is Obed. And Obed has a child. And his name is Jesse. And Jesse has a son. And his name is David. And Ruth, this Moabitist, and Malon, her husband, who the child was raised in the name of, in order to show the security and the surety of our salvation, are found in the very lineage and genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is exactly where we need to be found. 
I said I wanted to read a passage in closing. Would, in closing, would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10? <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. And we will let, I let, <laughs> we will trust the Spirit of God to speak these verses to our hearts. I purpose to make no comments on them. What did Boaz redeem exactly? He said, I redeemed it all. All. Nothing left to be redeemed. It's all been redeemed. <laughs> all of God's elect and all their needs to be redeemed has been bought by our kinsman redeemer. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of the things. Can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually. Make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered. Because that the worshiper once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. I come to do thy will. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will... We are sanctified through the body, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. The law said I cannot redeem. The law yields its right, its claim. Christ. The evidence of that is the resurrection. And what was redeemed? Oh, everything. Nothing left to be redeemed. He did it all. He did it all by himself. He finished the work. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for Christ. Thank you that you did not compromise your holy law. You maintained your justice and your righteousness and your holiness by providing a perfect sacrifice. One who came in the volume of the book to do thy will. Lord, we've never been able to perform your will once. We thank you that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We thank you for this table and the simplicity of it, of his body and of his blood. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would increase our faith as we as we receive these common elements, Lord, give us the spiritual light and truth to our hearts that we need. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Number three in the Sproul Hymnal. Let's stand together. Number three. Yeah.
debtor to mercy alone, of covenant mercy I sing, nor fear with thy righteousness on my person and offering to bring. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. The work which his goodness began, the arm of his strength will complete. His promise is yea and amen, and never was forfeited yet. Things future, nor things that are now, not all things below nor above, can make him his purpose forego, or sever my soul from his love. My name from the palm of his hands, eternity will not erase, Impressed on his heart it remains In marks of indelible grace Yes, I to the end shall endure As sure as the earnest is given More happy but not more secure The glorified spirits in heaven Please be seated. 